In this Boca Physics video, you'll see a set of simulations depicting magnetism and matter. We begin with a simulation of a physical dipole. In this case, we view from a distance the magnetic field lines due to a current carrying loop. The multipole expansion is useful in approximating distant circuits. The dominant term in this expansion is the dipole term. The magnetic dipole moment is defined as the product of the current and the vector area of the loop. If we now assume that the current becomes infinitely large and the area of the loop gets infinitesimally small, such that their product remains fixed, we have a pure dipole. Whereas the magnetic field due to a current carrying loop has to be expressed in elliptic integrals or in terms of, say, modified Bessel functions, the magnetic field due to a pure dipole can be expressed as a simple formula. Notice that the field lines due to a pure dipole are very similar to the field lines due to a physical loop viewed from a distance. It's also interesting to observe what happens when a pure dipole is placed in an otherwise uniform magnetic field that points in a direction opposite to that of the dipole. In this case, there is a spherical boundary which no field line can cross. Field lines in the immediate vicinity of the dipole are highlighted in aqua, and field lines outside of the spherical boundary are white. In the absence of the dipole, the field lines due to a uniform magnetic field would simply be straight lines. Notice how they bend, however, around the spherical boundary enclosing the dipole. We are now in a position to set up the framework to calculate the magnetic field due to magnetized matter. There are three basic types of magnetization discussed in electromagnetism. Diamagnetism, the magnetization in the, is in the opposite direction of the applied magnetic field. Paramagnetism, the magnetization is in the same direction as the applied magnetic field. And ferromagnetism, the magnetization persists even in the absence of an applied magnetic field. An in-depth discussion of the origin of magnetism in solids lies outside the scope of an electromagnetism course and instead belongs in solid state physics. For the present, we'll simply assume that matter has a given magnetization, which is defined as a magnetic dipole moment per unit volume. Let's first consider matter of uniform magnetization. We can visualize matter as being composed of very many dipoles of the same magnitude and pointing in the same direction. Charge and motion gives rise to magnetic fields. So how can a magnetic field arise when there is no transport of charge? Orbiting electrons and electron spin give rise to currents. In the case of uniform magnetization, the currents cancel each other out in the interior of the slab, however the currents on the edge of the slab do not. Even though there is no charge transport, there is a net current that flows around the edge. In this example, the magnetization is directed upwards. The normal to the slab points outwards, and the current flows in a counterclockwise direction as viewed from this vantage point. Expressed mathematically, the bound surface current density is a cross product of the magnetization and the normal. Let's next consider matter that is not uniformly magnetized. Once again, we'll visualize matter as being composed of very many dipoles, but this time they do not have the same magnitude and might not be pointing in the same direction. We wish to calculate the net current upwards. First, consider two adjacent cells that lie along the y-axis and consider the x component of the magnetization. Let the magnetization in the first element be mx. It follows that the magnetization in the second element is mx plus the partial derivative of mx with respect to y plus higher order terms that can be neglected. The net current that flows upward due to these two cells is then minus the partial derivative of the x component of m with respect to y times del x del y. A similar analysis is done on two adjacent cells that lie along the x-axis, and we consider the y component of the magnetization. The net current due to these two cells is the partial derivative of the y component of m with respect to x times del x del y. Altogether, the net current upwards is in the partial derivative of my with respect to x minus the partial derivative of mx with respect to y, all times del x del y. This difference of partial derivatives is just the z component of the curl operator. 
Therefore, the bound volume current density is just the curl of the magnetization. Let's examine the magnetic fields due to solid objects. We treat the case of a uniformly magnetized sphere. There is no bound volume current density, and the bound surface current density is a cross product of the magnetization vector and the normal to the surface of the sphere. As this problem does not involve free currents, its solution reduces to solving Laplace's equation using Legendre polynomials. We first solve for a magnetic scalar potential from which the H field is calculated. Once the H field is obtained, the magnetic field is equal to mu naught H plus M inside and mu naught H outside. We see that the magnetic field inside the sphere is uniform. Notice the straight lines and the uniform color. Outside, however, the magnetic field is identical to that of a pure dipole. The next simulation depicts the magnetic field lines in 3D. Let's next treat the case of a cylinder of finite length with uniform magnetization in the z-direction. Although this is a graduate level problem, it's instructive to consider the qualitative behavior of the magnetic field. Because the magnetization is uniform, there is only a bound surface current density, the current flows around the cylinder in a circumferential direction, and no current flows on the ends of the cylinder. Ultimately, the magnetic field is expressed as an integral over modified Bessel functions, and the numerics of this example are somewhat more difficult than in the previous example. Notice that the field lines form closed loops, being fairly straight inside the cylinder, noticeably bending near the ends of the cylinder, and curved, of course, outside. Magnetic field lines form closed loops, except for the field line that lies on the axis of the cylinder. Next, consider the case of a cylinder, the length of which is smaller than its radius. The field lines appear very similar to those of a current-carrying loop. In the limit of a disk of uniform magnetization, we regain the solution for our current-carrying loop. Finally, consider the field lines due to a cylinder, the length of which is much larger than its radius. The field lines are straight inside the cylinder and form very large loops outside. We can begin to understand the behavior of a magnetic field due to an infinitely long cylinder of uniform magnetization, a problem that can be solved using Ampere's law. Because in that case there is no free current, and because of the symmetry of the problem, the H field vanishes everywhere. We immediately conclude that the magnetic field B also vanishes outside, but has value mu naught m inside. We see similar kind of behavior reflected in this simulation. The field is nearly uniform inside and gets very small outside. And notice how the magnitude of the magnetic field drops off drastically once the magnetic field line exits the cylinder.